Welcome to Ask GC Anything, your opportunity to ask us your burning cycling questions. And if you've got any for next week, make sure you leave them in the comment section down below or use the hashtag TalkBack on various forms of social media. Yeah, right. Without further ado, let's crack on with answering some questions. First up, we've got this one from Andrew Hendricks. He said, I've got a race soon and someone is letting me borrow a carbon bike. Fucking man. But how do I practice for it without that bike? Well, it is going to be rather hard to replicate riding with that bike without it. Uh, you're going to want to try, though, to replicate the similar position that you've got on your current bike as closely as you possibly can. Yeah, so most importantly is to get your saddle in exactly the same position. So measuring the height, first of all, but also how forward or back it is in relation to the bottom bracket. And then the next thing is to make sure your handlebars are in the right place. Once you've got those sorted, actually, there's not going to be that much difference, is there? No, you'll be able to concentrate on maybe a lighter bike and one that works slightly better rather than feeling differences in position. Now, Hadley, so I went through how to measure your position on the bike, which should help you in your cause fairly shortly. And the video is right here. Well, that's you, mate. Look at that. What a position. From either a low rider to a low pro. Very quick and easy. You simply measure vertically downwards from the top of your handlebars down to the floor and then from the top of your saddle down to the floor. You then subtract the first one from the second and you've got your drop. The next question comes in from Hoyd Aradia de la Cruz. Uh, hashtag talkback. Do those expensive saddles make you any faster, Si? Well, they do make you a bit faster. I suppose when you buy an expensive saddle, you've probably also got an expensive bike, which is going to make you faster. That's why you do it. But as always, in fact, as we just alluded to in the previous question, the most important thing is to make sure your saddle is in the right place. Now, we're lucky enough here on GCN to use expensive saddles. We get to use physique ones. And in this video that's going on behind down at the minute, they actually explain how to put that saddle in exactly the right place for you, how to measure it up. So make sure you check that out. The first model to start with is the Arione, uh, which belongs to the snake family. So it's the saddle for very flexible people. Um, Adjusting this saddle is really, really simple, being it uh, uh, extremely flat on the top, which means that you can just place the spirit level on top of it and check whether it is uh, uh, centered or not. All right, quick fire question time now. Dan, first up, Doug Hungerford has asked, do you guys still have all or most of your old bikes? I've got some of mine, but I wish I kept them all. He says. Well, I certainly don't have all, and I certainly don't have most, unfortunately. Uh, you generally have to give bikes back to sponsors at the end of the year. So what I'm left with is a Rally mountain bike from my elite mountain biking days, and a Cervelo S3 from my time with that particular team. Sorry, mate. Which, which team? The Cervelo test team. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's I right. forgot about that. Uh, but the same situation applies really to us now, side, doesn't it? Because we've got some fantastic bike partners, but they all require their bikes back once we finish with them. Yeah, that is true. I'm the same with Dan. I've got one or two knocking around from the old days, but really, it's nice just riding new stuff, isn't it? Yes, yeah, very it. nice, must admit. Uh, Anton van der Merwe says, physics question, two gear selections, same gear ratio and same cadence for both. One on the small chain ring, the other on the big ring. Does one generate power more efficiently, e.g. something like 52 uh -huh. by 19 by 39 by 14? Yes, very good question. Gear ratios are less or more efficient than each other, apparently. So generally speaking, the larger the diameter chainring and the larger the diameter sprocket at the back will mean that you get less friction, so therefore you get a more efficient gear up until a certain point when your chain line actually starts to decrease the efficiency again. So I think, as soon as you remember, it's like three sprockets down from your biggest sprocket at the back is when you want to drop it into the little ring. But yeah, so actually big ring, quite a long way at the back, is more efficient than Little Ring all the way down the back. This is one of the reasons why time trial great Tony Martin went with a 58 tooth ring. I think we all went, wow, 58 tooth by 11, what on earth is he pushing there? But really, it's to make sure that he's in the 58, but midway up the block at the back. So the chain line's accurate, and as I said, both of the rings are a bit bigger and therefore more efficient. Yeah, we're talking some pretty big watts, aren't we? Like four, five, six watts savings just from your gear selection. Mm. So yeah, worth thinking about that. All right then, uh, Euro Sib Bricks uh, says, 
in capital letters actually, so I guess he's shouting, I'm 10 and road racing on a cross bike. Right. Sorry, but still getting good results. Should I get a road bike? Bearing in mind, I still do cyclocross. Now he's 10, but I guess this is gonna to apply to anyone no matter how old they are, aren't they? Well, I don't know. I think maybe it's slightly different for a 10 year old. If he's already been very successful on a cyclocross bike, I would personally say that he could just continue to use it. I'm assuming that he's already got slick tires on it and therefore not producing an enormous amount of rolling resistance on slightly more knobbly tires. But I think more gains are going to be made at a 10 year old by training and just going out with friends and just enjoying things and getting used to tactics and everything else. And it's always good to have in the back of your pocket the fact that you can later upgrade to a much better, decent road bike. Yeah. Right. Uh, Last of the quickfire questions yeah. comes from Ed, who says, I'm 50 and I recently got a smart trainer with a power meter, but I often hear on GCN that you can't do the same power indoors. How much difference does indoor training make? Well, it's hard to quantify and it probably changes from one person to the next. But yes, a little bit like some people can produce more power on a climb than they can on the flat due to the way that the power is delivered through the pedals. Some people often find the same thing indoors and that can be down to the inertia of the trainer but it can also be down to the fact that you're often hotter on an indoor trainer than you would be when being cooled by a breeze on the, out ro on the road outside, should I say. Yeah. Generally speaking, it's the longer efforts that suffer the most, aren't they? So anything over five minutes and you're going to see a little drop off in power. Probably, what are we talking, maybe 20 watts doing a threshold test, maybe Depends a bit more, what 30 watts. Is. Depends what your watch is in the first place. That's a very if good If you're point. only pushing 100 watts, then 30 watts would be a rather big decrease to see. Yeah, all right. Fair point, mate. Well made. Next up from Ewan Munro. Hey folks, I now have deep section wheels and while people say that they are not bad in a crosswind, they are still affected more than shallow rims. So do you have any tips for dealing with crosswinds? Well, I suppose ultimately if the crosswind is bad enough, you're probably going to want to leave your deep section wheels at home. True. Because they do, as you rightly pointed out, catch the wind a little bit more. I suppose in terms of using deep section wheels and crosswinds, any tips, you probably want to make sure you're always concentrating and you keep a good hold of the handlebars so the front wheel doesn't get wrestled out. But there are other in fact, hundreds of tips about riding in crosswinds. We've got a few of them on this video that's going on behind us. So if you check that out, that'll give you a few more practical tips like positioning and so forth, and that might help you as well with your quest for crosswind greatness. Just before you go, we have noted that it is the front wheel that affects things more when steering, of course. So the rear wheel might be all right and deep section still. And try not to ride too close to the side of the road but there may come a point when it's just too dangerous to ride in the wind, and you have to admit defeat. Brace yourselves. Dermot M has asked, can you please do a video on quick and easy stretches for before and after cycling? Well, the answer, Dermot, is yes, we can. Yes, we have. Oh. I've got to de uh, delve deep into the archives to find this one, though. It's from when the channel first launched back in 2013. Uh, this is Matt Rabin with Dan Martin, who at the time were both... I thought that was you, mate. I thought, God, you changed. No, Dan Three Martin. Years. Matt Rabin, yeah. uh, both at the time with the Garmin team, now known as Cannondale Drapak, and Matt, the chiropractor at the team. Here he goes through some dynamic stretches to avoid injury whilst cycling. Exercise number two, is for your piriformis muscle. Your piriformis muscle comes across and stabilizes the outside of your hip and your low back. So this exercise, is, this, this stretch is really important to get the muscle working for cycling because this muscle takes a bit of a beating during cycling. A lot of ath athletes, cyclists, recreational cyclists will get pain and tingling down the legs sometimes. It can be because this muscle is getting a little bit pinched and trapped. So it's exactly the same premise as before. However, this time you're gonna turn your leg out Grab your leg like this, and you're going to pull up as high as you can, and you're going to alternate for left and right as we go across that five meter path in here. So, same thing again, away you go. So, leg up, good. Right, we have got some more content for you to watch right now. So, Sire actually did some testing about a year or so ago to find out how much deep section rims actually make out in the real world in a time trial. So, you can find that just up there. Yeah, it's quite a lot, actually. Or for a more recent video, why not check out just down there where we investigate, yes, investigate the safety issues regarding HGVs or trucks on the roads. It's worth a watch. Subscribe to the channel by clicking on the globe and make sure you give us a thumbs up only if you've liked this video.